with every generation that has passed us by. Long live the cause of freedom. And every event that has shaped who we are comes the awareness that history lives in all of us. Pick a time, choose a place, and escape to where the past comes alive. Mine eyes have seen the glory. The History Channel. Hi, I'm Bob Vila. Thanks for joining me on my tour of some of America's greatest historic homes. I've always admired the grand and gracious homes of the Old South, and I've chosen a couple of my favorite locations that are open to the public. They come with pedigrees, with associations to famous people and important events. In the South, early settlements were essentially business investments, some established by London trading companies. The climate and the aristocratic roots of many of its early colonists helped create the plantation system. A wealthy and cultured elite emerged. The South before the Civil War was a culture of rich landowners whose big money crops produced big fortunes and big houses to match. Some of them were studied copies of great European buildings. Others, flamboyant exercises in American excess. Perhaps more than any other, one individual represents the best of his era and his region in the years immediately following the American Revolution. One of his greatest legacies, the University of Virginia, speaks clearly for the ideals of that man and his new nation. This is one of America's best known, best loved, and most admired architectural sites, as its creator called it, the Academical Village. The reason we're here is Thomas Jefferson. He was a remarkable man of many, many talents, worthy of the title Renaissance Man. The Declaration of Independence was largely his work. He was a lawyer, a scientist, an inventor, the nation's first Secretary of State and its third president. But in his heart, he was an architect. For every ivy-covered university that imitates the look of Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, there's a goodly number of classically inspired campuses with quads or commons, or as they call it here, the lawn at their centers. All the others in Maryland, Georgia, and California, the Midwest, across the South, they're echoes of this one, Mr. Jefferson's. All the buildings are different, based upon various classical models published by Palladio, De Chambray, and Erard. Jefferson's intention was to educate the students both directly by offering them copies of great buildings to study, and indirectly by surrounding them in this, the historic precinct, with that great architecture. The arrangement is of 10 buildings called pavilions, five on each side of the lawn. Thus, Jefferson's University consisted of 10 separate houses, lodgings, he called them, for professors, with classrooms within each. He wrote to the governor of Virginia as he was planning the school, and he said, I would strongly recommend, instead of one immense building, to have a small one for each professorship. The village form is preferable to a single great building. In the final design, the colonnades connecting the professor's pavilions contained 109 15-foot square dormitory rooms. Other supporting structures were built behind the pavilions. The 10 pavilions are all subtly different. They're all basic temple fronts, and all of them are Jeffersonian classicism, which is based on ancient Roman architecture, design, and decoration. Let's kind of take one apart a little bit while we're looking at it. We have four columns, and the columns in, uh, in most of them are the same, but the, the uh, capitals, the order of the capitals varies. In this case, they are Ionic order, a very simple type of capital, and they're made out of Carrara marble that was brought over from Italy. The element, the horizontal element across the top of the building that rests on the columns 
is made up of three different features. The very top of it is a cornice, which projects out from it. In the middle, there is a frieze, which is always filled with some sort of applied decoration. In the bottom, there is an architrave, which really uh, uh, gives you the sense of structure. The whole is called an entablature. And if you look in the frieze closely, that's where you get the payoff, because you have this wonderful collection of uh, putty, the little babies, holding garlands of fruit and leaves. And in between them, you have these skulls. All of these are ancient Roman decorations that are literally lifted from the temple of Fortuna Virilis, as drawn by Andrea Palladio. The triangular element above all of this, which we all think of as the classic house shape, is known as the tympanum or the pediment, two words, same meaning. And if you look closely along all of those three lines in the triangle, you'll see all sorts of additional ornamentation. The dentals are the little things that actually look like teeth and then there is an additional egg and dart applied to it. Now, let's talk about some of the practical aspects of these pavilions. They were designed to house these professors who were first coming here at, you know, 1819, 1818, and so the upstairs of each pavilion was a residence, the downstairs would, would have been a classroom. And he very thoughtfully provided for these professors to have some outdoor space, a balcony or, or terrace, whatever you want to call it. They don't touch those columns. They're hung by steel rods. This is... Jefferson, not just the architect, but the inventor. Closing the end of the lawn is the rotunda. It wasn't part of Jefferson's original conception, but added at the suggestion of Benjamin Latrobe, one of the designers of the Capitol and America's first formally trained architect. Jefferson added the structure and made it the library. It's a half-scale interpretation of the Pantheon in Rome. The construction of the rotunda was completed a few months after Jefferson's death. To contrast the classical grace and sheer beauty of Thomas Jefferson's buildings, our next stop will be a native Virginia farmhouse. We're in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains, a short drive from Charlottesville and the University of Virginia, visiting Ashland Highland. The home of James Monroe, president from 1816 to 1825. Like Jefferson, he was also a governor of Virginia, a lawyer who once studied under Jefferson, and at one point, our minister to France. Jefferson invited Monroe and his family to come here and visit in Albemarle County in 1789. In fact, the invitation was for them to come and settle here. Jefferson's notion was to create an intellectual and social community, a, quote, society to our taste. Monroe purchased a thousand acres here, adjoining Monticello, for a thousand dollars. This historic home, although a museum today, is being interpreted as what it once was, a farmhouse and a presidential home. The Colonial Revival Garden was added in the early 20th century. The farm eventually grew to some 3,500 acres, and it remained the Monroe's residence for 25 years. Subsequent owners added this Victorian front. In the mid-70s, it was gifted to the College of William and Mary, which turned it into a museum, and a very popular one with local school kids. Before we visit President Monroe's house, let's meet Jim Wooten, the curator. Hi, Jim. Hi, Bob. Welcome to Ashland Highland. Thank you. 3,500 acres of land, even in the early 1800s, seems like an important plantation. Well, this was a fairly typical plantation of central Virginia mm -hmm. in the early 1800s. Mm -hmm. 3,500 acres included about 400 acres cleared for crops, as well as space for sawmill, grist mill, vineyards, orchards, uh, a pretty self-contained, self-supporting economy here. Now, what would the main crops have been? The main crops started out to be tobacco, as it was with most plantation houses in Virginia. Yeah. But eventually, Monroe diversified his crops to include corn, wheat, uh, and other grains such as barley. Now, are some of the structures that are here original? We have a combination here of original, restored, and reconstructed buildings. Mm -hmm. The building just behind us is Monroe's overseer's house. This little building uh, was the sometime part-time residence of the overseer or farm manager who had a not very well-liked position on the plantation. Mm -hmm. Because he was the direct manager of the 30 to 40 slaves who lived and worked here, he was fairly despised by the slave population. Yeah. And at the same time, he didn't enjoy any of the uh, advantages that Monroe or Monroe's peers would have enjoyed. He was caught in something of a no-man's land. He was not uh, a peer of the owner. In exactly. any way. No, he was a hired hand of the owner, and yet not someone who developed any camaraderie with the slave population. Right. Now, who would have lived in a little house like this? This building is a reconstruction of the Monroe slave quarters. The originals were torn down in the 1920s, but through a 1908 photograph and archaeology, we were able to reconstruct these buildings uh, 10 years ago. That's terrific. Uh, this housed three families. These were the house servants. Okay. They had the most direct access and interaction with the Monroe family. 
the other uh, members of the slave population lived in much simpler buildings along the edges of the fields here. These buildings are not at all crude. And this little sh uh, shed here? This was our smokehouse. This is our one unrestored Monroeite building. Uh, this building was put up about 1810 or so and used, of course, for smoke curing and preserving meats on the plantation. Okay. Then the president's house itself um, is relatively modest, I would think. It is. It's a fairly typical Virginia farmhouse from the early 1800s. Monroe returned from France heavily in debt in 1797 and built simply, but built solidly. Mm -hmm. Now, were the brick made on site? The brick were made here on site. Yeah. And the house itself, a clabbered house. Now, did it include porches and the wing on the back? Not initially. When the house was first built, it was only one room deep in this section mm -hmm. with two to three rooms that no longer survive. Mm -hmm. In 1816, Monroe saw the need for additional space. He added the south porch here and added a north wing that included two interior rooms. It's interesting cornice detailing that, that, that you see up along the, uh, the roof line there. Yeah, that cornice was largely hidden from us for most of the 19th and 20th century. Really? In the course of restoring this porch in 1993, we removed a later drop ceiling, and boy, were we surprised. When we did, we expected to find some remnants of cornice, mm -hmm. but we found a full run of cornice, a full run of weatherboarding, of original chestnut shingles, and even a run of original circa 1820 paint. Fabulous. Now, the front door is by the Colonial Garden recreation, yes, right? Yes, that's correct. Come in. This is a surprising entrance. It's quite, quite low. This is the front door? This was a front door. The principal front door was replaced by the Victorian house. Oh, sure, yep. And, but why the little tiny arch here in front of the door? This is a nice touch. Um, there are two chimneys here feeding the fireplaces in these two rooms. Okay. The flues come up and join over your head to form one central chimney. Gotcha. It's a very neat little detail. So how big is the house? The, the, uh, I see at least two, three rooms right yeah. here. Today the house is basically five rooms. Uh, two bed chambers, a drawing room, a dining room, and Monroe's study. Come so in. this was his study. You're struck immediately by the contrast between the size and the simplicity of the room and the high-style furniture. Well, you know, that's what some of Monroe's contemporaries commented on when they visited the Monroe's here. Mm -hmm. Although Monroe's, the Monroe's built simply, they did decorate quite nicely. Monroe was in France twice as our minister to that country. All right, yeah. The first time during the French Revolution uh -huh. when the, the uh, Republicans were really selling the royalist furniture deep discounts. Right, so he was acquiring some very important furniture at just the right time. Tell us about the desk here in the den. The desk here was made by the same cabinet maker who made the desk on which Monroe wrote the document that would become the Monroe Doctrine, an early uh, statement of U.S. foreign policy. Okay. This is Louis XV style. You're looking at about 1795. 1795. And the clock on top of it? The clock on top is also from that same period, a little bit later, about 1810. That's carved alabaster. Alabaster. So he had fine taste. Look at this dining room. Huh? Yeah. Well, this room is quite a contrast. Well, this is a more public room, Bob, than mm -hmm. the study we just came from. Even more casual visitors to Highland would have expected perhaps to take a meal with the Monroes in this room. The contrast, though, is also in the furnishings. This does not look like French furniture. Yes, you're exactly right. This is a combination of styles from throughout the Monroe's lives. Mm -hmm. The table here is a fairly early piece in our collection. It was made in New York about 1785. Look at that. It's a single piece of wood, isn't it? That is, yes. Magnificent. Um, among our oldest Monroe pieces. This, of course, opens up. The banquet ends here separate, and this can be made into a 12-foot long table. So what appears to be a round table is actually two half rounds that would have been put together with this into a big, long, beautiful dining table. Exactly. Very and nice. this stylistically still harkens back to the 18th century tradition of uh -huh. copying the English cabinet makers. Yes. This is a very simplified rendition of Apple White. What about the chairs? The chairs, on the other hand, are really uh, quite a composite from American cabinet makers drawing their inspiration of the French Empire designs that the Monroes were using here and in Washington. Heavily carved. So is the parlor through there? No, Bob, the parlor is through here. Jim, tell us about the wallpaper here in the, in the uh, drawing room. This is wallpaper from the early 19th century, Monroe's time. Mm -hmm. It was made by the Zavere wallpaper firm in France, and it shows the hunting landscape, a continuous panorama of different hunting scenes throughout the room. Yeah, look at that pack of hounds going after the wild boar in the corner there. Yeah, and the hunters lying in wait. 
So this would have been in the early 1800s? Early 1800s. This paper was given to us for our restoration about 15 years ago. How about all this furniture here? This is uh, empire furniture, isn't it? This is French empire furniture, mm -hmm. um, all mahogany that the Monroes brought back with them from Monroe's second visit to France in mm -hmm. 1807. Now you'll notice the wood on this furniture is all natural mahogany, none of it is gilded. Uh, Monroe thought gilt wood was just a little too imperial to use in a new democracy. However, some of his visitors in France said the plain wood really didn't suit the French architecture and would look better in America than it did in France. It wasn't fancy enough for the French. Uh, Napoleon? Speaking of the French, Napoleon Bonaparte, Monroe had the good fortune of being at Notre Dame Cathedral the day Napoleon crowned himself Emperor of France and in effect of the world. Later, Monroe was presented at Napoleon's court. Napoleon gave him this marble likeness of himself. And here it is almost two centuries later. Exactly. Now, would this have been the original front entryway? This door led to the original front entrance hall, which today is the Victorian entrance hall. This bronze bust of Monroe was done by the Italian sculptor Attilio Picciarelli around 1930. He was a handsome man. Yes, we think he was. But our real pride and joy is a piece of Monroe memorabilia over here. It's this blonde Honduras mahogany table. Mm -hmm. The tabletop was cut from one solid slab of wood. You can see here both in the graining uh, and the yes, cross grain. Yeah, yeah. It's not matched boards. It's all one board. And that continues around the back. This opens to a round table with a six-foot diameter. That was an enormous tree then. Yes, indeed. Now, why was it given to them? The wood was given to the Monroes as a gesture of appreciation for what came to be known as the Monroe Doctrine. Mm -hmm. This was a statement of foreign policy President Monroe made that said the emerging nations of North and Central and South America were no longer open to European colonization and not open to any type of European interference or intervention. Yeah, we basically offered them U.S. protection. Exactly. Thanks for the tour, Jim. Thank you, Bob. President Monroe and his family lived a comfortable, even luxurious existence here in the Virginia countryside in the early 19th century, but nothing to compare to the Jeffersonian lifestyle at neighboring Monticello. Before we visit there, though, Jefferson's retreat at Poplar Forest. We're at an estate called Poplar Forest, just outside of Lynchburg, Virginia, in Bedford County. In Jefferson's day, a man on horseback required two days riding to get from Charlottesville to this location. Today, in about an hour and a half, you can drive here. Mr. Thomas Jefferson built his home away from home here on land that his wife, Martha, had inherited from her father. Unlike so many major houses in New York and New England, the impressive early plantation homes here in the South don't sit beside the road. Instead, one approaches through fields, often along country lanes or elaborately landscaped drives. Today, this house sits amidst almost 500 acres, but once the property was a highly profitable plantation of some 5,000 acres on which tobacco and wheat were grown. Jefferson built his house here while he was president, although it continued a building for many years after he left office. But you have to remember that he held elective office or a point of office for over 40 years. He was a very popular man. In fact, admirers came to see him in droves at his principal residence, Monticello, which of course is in Charlottesville. But here he built himself what he called his retreat, where he could escape for extended visits several times a year and try to find well, the solitude of a hermit, as he put it, although often he came accompanied by his beloved granddaughters, Ellen and Cornelia. Today, the house is being restored by its owner, the nonprofit corporation for Jefferson's Poplar Forest. Travis McDonald is restoration coordinator here at Poplar Forest. Hi, Travis. Hi, Bob. Welcome to this unusual house. It is unusual. Thank you. It's, it's gorgeous from the outside, and yet when you walk in, is this the way it's supposed to be, such a narrow corridor? Jefferson had a very narrow passage that we've temporarily put back, mm -hmm. and this leads to another very unusual feature, but intentional, yeah. which was a wonderful 20-foot high space. In fact, it's not only 20 foot high, it's 20 feet wide, so making this a cube. It's a perfect cube. Let's take a quick look at the model here. The, the, we just entered through this door, and of course the house doesn't really look at all like this. Uh, this is what you hope to achieve. This is a restored view, and it looks very low and horizontal on the front, mm -hmm. which is part of Jefferson's design intention, making it look like a French house that he admired in Paris. Uh -huh. But if you walk around to the back, it looks two-story. He worked the topography. Right. This house is, is really a combination of many things that he collected 
through his lifetime and put into this final masterpiece. Many architectural elements and design features that he saw when he was minister to France and on his travels in Europe. Right. This is really a combination of, of many things, but in the end, it's a very American work. Mm -hmm. Very Virginian as well. It's a special place, and we're looking at the actual 200-year-old walls here, but yet the ceiling got dropped at some point. How did that happen? This was, the house suffered the fate of many houses, alterations, even a fire, and this attic space was inserted, bringing the cube down to a lower level. Uh -huh. But see. we can still see many of the original features in the house. For instance, this fireplace over here is one of the original features. It's unusual because it does not have a chimney above it. Well, wait a minute, it won't work without a chimney. It has a diagonal flue. I see. But interestingly, we see that it was originally constructed higher, and Jefferson brought it back down to this level during one of his visits to the site. Because he was building this long distance. He wasn't here every day to oversee construction. He was the president. Right, and there are about 1,500 letters from him to and from the workmen that tell us about the construction of this house. Uh -huh. And now, he lived in this house until he died as using it as a retreat. He was in Monticello, which was his formal residence, but this was his private place to come and rest and to visit with his grandchildren and the like, right? Right. It's a, it's a very personal, autobiographical house, very intimate. In fact, we can see the intimacy from this unusual plan here. Mm -hmm. This is an octagonal house in its exterior form, but you see as you enter the way you enter the front and into this middle room, we have rooms that wrap around the 20-foot square. And each is an elongated octagon. Right. right. Each with a fireplace on each end. Mm -hmm. There are four chimneys that serve 15 fireplaces. And there, there was a disastrous fire here that was caused by that chimney, wasn't it? Right. We think this one chimney with the diagonal flue caused the fire. Yeah. This, this plan is very simple and you can understand what Jefferson does in the house, which is to read, to write, and to think. It's a very private place. But let me ask you a little bit about restoration in a house like this. It's gone through a fire, different ownership, and now you've more or less gutted it to the fabric that remains from Jeffersonian days. How will you know what to restore, how to trim it out, for example? We've removed all the modern parts, and what we do is we look for the ghost stories. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we're talking about the ghost of physical features. There was a nailing block here that held a chair rail. Same thing for the baseboard. And this is similar for all the attached wooden trim pieces in the house. Well, what's that wooden trim going to look like? Well, because of the letters of Jefferson, uh, we know what some of this looks like. For instance, in this central dining room, we have a Roman example of an entablature. Jefferson orders the frieze parts from a sculptor, but tells him that he wants to add the cow skulls to what should have just been the faces, and he explains that he can do this and indulge his fancy in his own private house. It's my house. <laughs> okay. Right. He can do what he wants. So this would have been a bedchamber on the other side here. Right. Mm -hmm. This was the granddaughter's bedchamber, and in this room we have some interesting ghost stories to tell. Mm -hmm. For instance, this was one of 15 fireplaces in the house but this had been closed up in 1846. Uh -huh. So when it was open, it gave us our view of some very unaltered but interesting and important features. That instance, flat arch, yeah. An iron lintel for the flat arch, nailing blocks for the surrounds, even some evidence inside here of an iron fireback that we know Jefferson orders from a local iron furnace. Marvelous, isn't that wonderful? And what about the windows? Weren't they also altered? Right. One of the biggest changes from the exterior is the lowering of the windows about a foot in the wall. Actually, above this window, we can see how much higher the window should be, and we can see the indication of its missing arch. So in the restoration process, all the windows will be replaced and brought up right. to that height? And this year, we're replacing all the windows and doors on the exterior. Travis, what is happening here? You've got chains and cables and all sorts of great stuff. This is one of our um, challenges, which is to tie together the walls that are trying to separate. And this is a masonry restoration. Now, architecturally, what would this little area have been? This is one of the stair towers that allows someone from this bedchamber to exit downstairs or through an upper door that was in this wall to the flat roof oh, okay. of a 100-foot yeah. terrace. I understand from this illustration here. 
because he essentially had attached a wing to the left side of the house. And what would, what would the rooms in there have been? Four rooms that were service rooms, a kitchen, a dairy, a smokehouse, and a cook's room. Let's go take a look. Okay. Well, Travis, there's an enormous amount of restoration that has to be done here, right? Right. This pavilion shows how much masonry restoration we need to do, and this is part of the project this year to do exterior work. Mm -hmm. Now, Jefferson added this wing because the house basically didn't have any um, kitchen or anything like that, right? Right. It started off as a pure octagon. Uh, he had to add the stair towers for practicality, but he also adds a 100-foot wing mm -hmm. that had four offices or service rooms, as he called them. Right. This uh, storage room here and then the actual kitchen, according to your signage, was right in this area. And then this part of the building remains from the original. Right. About 1840, half of this wing disappeared. We can now see what's left of the other half inside here. It looks like they added a roof to it. Right. This is originally a flat roof wing that was used as a terrace to walk on, just like Jefferson's wings at Monticello. So in the original house, it's so elegant, yet in the reconstruction of the 1840s, it becomes much more workmanlike. Right. Mm -hmm. What can you see in here? In here, archaeology has given us the, the floor, hearth, and if you can see on this photograph, we've recovered the actual floor pattern, the cross walls, the front walls, and all the remains in the ground, which once recorded were then covered up again. So that's all buried back out there. Right. It's better preserved in the ground. And then at some future point, you'll be able to reconstruct what's there. Right. We'll, yeah. we'll treat this in the future. The model is a help. We, we're, we're standing in here now in the, the, the kitchen, right? Right, it's a four room wing. Two rooms are missing today. This room, a kitchen, a cook's room, and then a smokehouse with an unusual vestibule that allowed you to feed the fire without getting into the smoky room. Neat. A covered walkway along that tied into the house on this side. And does it really butt into the side of a hill like this? This is one of the two mounds that Jefferson created which was part of the initial design. So they're part of the landscape feature. Right. That's an enormous mound. That's one of two mounds that were flanking the house on each side, uh -huh. originally connected to the house by trees, but replaced by the wing we were just in. OK, yeah. And these are very much a part of the, the Jefferson scheme for creating an ornamental landscape. We can see here. The sunken lawn was dug by hand, which created the dirt. So they for took both all mounds. the they took all the soil from here to create the mounds. Right, and here on the slopes of this terrace, he created a continuous flower bed, and up on the top, an alley of Kentucky coffee trees. Now, how do you know what trees were here? Jefferson was, was good to leave us a, a good record of all these things. Mm -hmm. Archaeology confirms it physically. Magnificent. Before you see what Henry's doing over here on the masonry on the portico, I'd like to show you something on the other side of this mound. There's the other mound. This is one of the two privies that flank the mounds on each side of the house. And these are one of the wonderful features that are miniature versions of the house. They're octagonal. They have the squint bricks for the corners. They have the original woodwork. They're well preserved. Even the Palladian proportion is correct to one-eighth of an inch in terms of the, the proportions of this. And it has a wonderful frame and original domed roof. So these are jewels out of this whole complex of buildings. As it were, mm -hmm. breakout houses. Right. Travis, thank you. I think I'll go check in with Henry. Thanks, Bob. Henry Kersley is a restoration masonry specialist who was working here at uh, Poplar Forest, and can I interrupt you for a minute, Henry? Sure. It does look like fun, but um, we're used to mixing mortar with a hoe and having it look kind of gray-green, and this looks very exotic. Tell me about this. This is uh, just lime and sand like Jefferson's workmen would have used originally, mm -hmm. and we're preparing it by traditional methods. If we try to uh, mix this stuff in uh, a modern mortar mixer or with a hoe like it's done these days, it, it just doesn't come out right. It's uh, this mixture is far too stiff to mix in, in modern mixers. And I take it this is a tool that you've crafted yourself? It's just a 
piece of white oak. I, there's references in uh, historic text about beating the mortar, uh -huh. but I never found any that described what the beater should look like, so I just took a guess at it. You're doing a great job. Now, it's, it's a tan-colored mortar. Is that uh, dictated by the kind of sand that you find here on the property? There's sand on the property that matches the sand in the original mortar, uh -huh. uh, but there was not enough for the job that we have to do here. So this, this is a blend of commercial sands that's trucked in here, and it's got a little bit of silt in it to give it some color, mm -hmm. but it's just sand and lime. Now, there's, it seems like there's very little water in this mixture. Is that your objective? Well, it's, it's part of the reason for beating it. Uh, if we put enough water in it to mix it by conventional mixing methods, it's too much for a lime-based mortar. Modern mortars have a lot of cement in them, uh, but we can mix using a beater uh, with 25% less water uh -huh. than we can if we use conventional methods. And what's the advantage of that? Since all that water has to come out of the mortar as it dries and as it cures, mm -hmm. uh, there's less shrinkage in it if there's less water in it. I got you. So well, is this batch ready to go? It's ready to go. Great. You're in the process of rebuilding um, a series of arches here that are the foundation for the terrace just above and uh, off of the parlor. Which way are you going with it? I'm just going around here. And you've already done much of the much of the restoration work right on the face of it here, where you can see not only the uh, the color but uh, also the texture of it. And I guess you get that smooth texture because of the way you've beat it. Uh, it's it's inherent in a lime-based mortar. Mm -hmm. Conventional mortars simply don't have that smooth buttery texture to it, but a lime-based mortar does. What I have to do, uh, the masonry has to be dampened beforehand, otherwise the mortar won't stick to it, and I have to put it in in several layers. If you try to put it all in at one time, uh, it, it shrinks too much and you get cracks in it. Now you suppose this is the way they would have done it uh, a couple hundred years ago? No, originally they just, uh, they laid it up and they tooled it as they built the masonry up. There was, uh, this is just a method of repair mm -hmm. that was done, as I gather, about once every 50 years because the mortar is soft enough where it just deteriorates and it needs to be replaced occasionally. Okay, but the, the key in the, uh, in the look of the facade is in the way the, uh, the mortar is tooled, as it were. It's kind of rounded and given this, this kind of scored line that goes through it. How do you do that? The purpose of the bead, it serves no structural purpose. It's decorative more than anything. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's narrow and it's struck off of a straight edge. So they, Original masons knew that they were working with a, a rough textured material. A rough, irregular material, yeah. That little bead serves the purpose of just drawing your eye away from the roughness. It's an interesting thought that you're using the same, uh, the same bricks that they originally used. Can I look at the tool you got there? Sure. Did you make this yourself? Yeah, I made it uh, about four or five years ago. And so it's, it's essentially the tool you use to put the score on. Right. I couldn't find anything uh, commercially available that I could use for the beading, so I just made something. It's an eccentric tool, and it's a very, very unusual job you're doing. Look at that. Thanks, Henry. Okay. Now that we've visited Poplar Forest and we've learned a bit about its restoration and conservation, also about Thomas Jefferson, the man, the artist, it's time to see his most famous residence. Monticello, an Italian word meaning small mountain, is Jefferson's home near Charlottesville, Virginia. Some 600 feet elevated above the surrounding country, this is where Jefferson chose to build his home. He was born about two miles from here in 1743, and no doubt he played here as a little boy. Back then it was an uninhabited hilltop. He inherited the land at 21, this Monticello hillside constituting a thousand acres of a total of 5,000 that he would amass in his lifetime, buying neighboring farms. He was a highly successful farmer. He was 26 years old when construction began on Monticello. He was 66 when it was finished. And as he wrote to a friend, architecture is my delight, putting up and pulling down one of my favorite amusements. The first dwelling to go up here at Monticello is known as the Honeymoon Cottage. This is where Jefferson's Monticello began. Jefferson married Martha Wales Skelton, a young widow of 23, near Williamsburg. Legend has it that he brought his bride here after the wedding on New Year's Day in 1772 during a snowstorm. Apparently, the accommodations were satisfactory enough for a short stay. A daughter was born to the newlyweds a few days shy of nine months later, but they didn't stay long and shortly took up housekeeping in a home of the brides some distance away. When Jefferson married the beautiful and wealthy Martha, he himself was a man of property and of great prospects. But his dream house, Monticello, was just that, a dream, 
this little outbuilding was the only structure on the site. By 1774, the Jeffersons have moved into the first version of Monticello. I said a minute ago it took about 40 years for them to complete it. You have to remember we had the American Revolution taking place in between. Also, it wasn't that they just kept changing their mind. It was the fact that he was a brilliant designer and architect, and he traveled abroad, and he saw the latest in design at that time in Italy and France. And he was also interested in so many other things like horticulture. Here you're looking at one of several oval flower beds that have been recreated. They were recreated in the 1940s. The plant material you'll see is the exact plant material that was here in the 1700s because he kept records, not just of crop rotation in terms of agriculture, but of horticulture, and he planted. Here we're looking at a poplar tree, a tulip poplar. It's one of two that flanked Monticello, and it dates back to the 1700s. Like most great houses of the 18th and early 19th century, almost all of the materials were procured on site. The bricks were made on site. The stone, the limestone was quarried on site. The wood, of course, was cut down here, milled, and the trim work was made here. The nails were made here. There are a few notable exceptions, like the glass. The windows here at Monticello were made out of mahogany, and they were milled in Philadelphia. Some of the skilled laborers came from Philadelphia. But the genius of Jefferson is evident as we examine the garden facade, the one we see on the nickel. The nickel facade that we're all familiar with is actually the garden facade of Monticello. It is a perfect example of the Jeffersonian neoclassicism that we were talking about earlier when we were at the campus at the University of Virginia. Here, the man has taken all these elements from ancient Roman architecture. Then he has taken things that he has seen in neoclassicism when he was visiting as minister to France and when he traveled in Italy. He's brought them all home and reinterpreted them. But he has left the native materials out there, the red brick. He has made the whole thing come down to a very human level. These columns are not lofty temple columns. They're human scale. And yet it belies the fact that this is a three-story house with 21 rooms. This is the east facade of Monticello, and it's really the reception side. That's the front door. You can picture Thomas Jefferson coming out here between these columns to greet his guests. And in the years after his presidency, he had legions of guests, people from all over the world who came to visit, not just for dinner, but to spend a week visiting with the sage of Monticello. He lived to the ripe old age of 83 years, happy years. At one point, he had as many as 10 grandchildren living under this roof. He died and was buried right here. After his death, the house was auctioned off. And for nearly a century, the Levy family from New York owned and preserved the property. Since 1923, the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation has owned it and opened it to the public, receiving upwards of a half million visitors a year. Millions of people have come here. It's become a national shrine. Let's begin our tour in one room that few people see. We're inside the dome, the part of the house that's most famous, the part of the house you see on the coin. Nobody ever gets in here. It's an octagon inside here, about 26 feet in diameter, almost 19 feet, all these beautiful circular windows around it. It's recently been restored so that you have this color, this Mars yellow that's been hand applied. Now, when Jefferson designed the house, he intended this to be a parlor for ladies. He wasn't a big fan of staircases, though, and this is the third level. So one of the problems was that ladies couldn't get up here, especially in the costumes they wore. And so consequently, the room became a storage facility for many, many years. Right now, they are restoring it. They are planning on putting in a new floor cloth. But in all the years that Monticello has been open to the public, none of the visitors have really come up here. But we should get downstairs to the main reception hall, where we'll meet Susan Stein, who's the curator here at Monticello. Susan, it's proper that we should begin our tour here in the reception hall, because traditionally this is where anyone would have waited to see Mr. Jefferson, right? That's right. And this was not only his entrance hall, but also a museum, a place in which he could educate his friends and visitors. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of artifacts in, in evidence here. Every inch of wall space, I think, was covered here with something that Jefferson had to say. Mm -hmm. Up here are some natural history specimens and the head of a American bighorn sheep, a moose, a deer, and an elk that told the story about America's large animals. Mm -hmm. And exotic animals, because certainly you, you don't get the bighorn here in, in Virginia. Not at all. Jefferson right. had to look um, far to get that. And I think I recognize Voltaire over here next to the front door. 
Um, he was someone that Jefferson never met, but who influenced him. He was an important member of the French Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Now, the clock is something I've read about. This is the famous clock that has faces on the outside and a face on the inside, right? That's right. Jefferson designed that clock. We call it the Great Clock in 1793, and it was installed here in 1804. It's hooked to a Chinese gong on the roof that strikes every hour. And it's and been working for nearly two centuries. That's right. Amazing. And you'll see that it's a calendar clock with Sunday at the top. But they ran out of space on the wall and had to drill a hole so that there would be room for Saturday below. So to see Saturday, you've got to go to the basement. That's right. <laughs> And then, of course, he also had teaching aids, like the maps that we see here. Right. He had large wall maps that he obtained while he was president between 1801 and 1809. On top is the, uh, a popular map of Virginia made by Bishop James Madison, and below, a map of Europe. It really humanizes this house. It does. I think you really have a sense of what interested Jefferson here. Susan, there's a great deal of glass used in this house, which was rather special for the date. It was very precious, and Jefferson used it inside as well as outside. Here you see the double-acting doors that have been in continuous operation for nearly 200 years. So there's a mechanism below the floor yes. that if you pull one door, it opens the opposite door as well. Exactly. It's Did he invent this? No, it was an innovation that he saw and admired and incorporated into Monticello. Magnificent. And this is the parlor. This is the parlor. This is where Jefferson received his visitors. He established on the wall a gallery of worthies, the people that he admired most. Mm -hmm. uh, there were three tiers, and the people that he most admired were placed on the top tier. He's on the second tier. He's, on the, he's <laughs> on the second tier now, but there were 57 uh, portraits here originally. Very few of them survived today. Who painted Jefferson here in the corner? That's Gilbert Stewart's famous Edge Hill portrait of Jefferson. Uh, Stewart painted it in his Washington studio in 1805. It's a beautiful background, kind of gray-green, isn't it? It is. Who are the gentlemen on the, uh, over the window up there? Uh, they're some of the portraits of, of the discoverers of America. That's mm -hmm. Magellan and Cortez, mm -hmm. but Jefferson also had Columbus and Amerigo Vespucci. Uh -huh. Over there is Sir Walter Raleigh, and next to him, uh, the Marquis de Lafayette. And these little portraits down above the chair? They're uh, special miniatures that were painted for um, uh, John, by John Trumbull. The one on the left is Jefferson, as Trumbull thought he would have appeared at the time that he wrote the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Mm -hmm. On the right is Thomas Paine also part of Jefferson's Another collection. Patriot. And is this uh, bust of Jefferson also an original? This is one of the most extraordinary portraits of Jefferson. It is Houdin's terracotta patinated plaster that Jefferson sat for right before he left for America in uh, the summer of 1789. And this is thought to be the very plaster that was exhibited at the Salon in Paris in the fall of 1789. So this is truly a priceless piece. This is a wonderful portrait of Jefferson, and it's one of the most famous icons. Now, in front of us, there's a very unusual table. I've seen tables of this shape from the early parts of the 1800s, but not entirely out of marble. Well, this is an unusual table. It was one of the things that Jefferson shipped back from, from Paris among 86 crates of goods. This uh, table separates into two parts, and it occupied uh, two different crates, in right, fact. Really? And the apparatus that he has on top of it? Is an optique for viewing prints. Aha. Uh -huh. So it has a magnifier installed in it. It does. Fabulous. The floors in here, I take it, are also the original. They are. And they're in very good condition. They're parquet of cherry and beech. And they've been here uh, for more than 200 years. Now, when we visited his ret retreat, mm -hmm. um, we realized that the, the center of the octagon that he created there is a dining hall. Here, you have a more traditional floor plan. You have a reception hall and then a parlor. Where's the dining room? The dining room is right next door. I'm surprised there isn't a dining room table in the middle of the dining no, room. No, in Jefferson's time, dining tables were placed against the walls when they weren't being used. I see. 
So this would have just been moved out into the middle of the room. That's right, as it was needed. Mm -hmm. uh, let me point out another feature about the room that's interesting. In the mantel are hidden two dumbwaiters that carried wine from the wine cellar below directly to the dining room. I had heard he was a great lover of fine wines. He was, and imported wines from many different countries. Now, Susan, would this room have served a different function? This was a tea room, and in it, Jefferson found another opportunity to display the worthies that he admired. Here are John Paul Jones, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, and the Marquis de Lafayette. And all the objects that we see in this beautiful little room, are they original? Yes, the Epern especially, and the silver is notable. It's the silver that he acquired in France. We're in the Sanctum Sanctorum. That's right. This is Jefferson's private suite of rooms. This is his book room, which housed a tremendous collection of books, the largest library in the United States at the time. Really? Several thousand? Almost 7,000 books were sold by Jefferson to Congress after the British burned the Capitol in 1814. And his collection formed the nucleus of the present day Library of Congress. That's an amazing fact. But there's still hundreds of books here that were his, right? That's right. And he assembled a retirement library, in fact. And he wrote to John Adams, I cannot live without books. Mm -hmm. Now, the next chamber that's just beyond has his writing instruments and, his, and more of his books, but also his surveying things and the like? That's right. This is his cabinet. It was a, a space that few people ever entered. He had a wonderful reading and writing arrangement here, um, a revolving chair placed near a table with a revolving top, mm -hmm. and beneath it, a bench upon which he could rest his legs mm -hmm. so that he could consult books as he wrote. He had a revolving book stand here that could hold as many as five volumes. That's very useful if you're composing for and taking data from several different sources. That's right. And he was a prolific letter writer. He mm -hmm. wrote more than 20,000 letters during his lifetime. And his favorite device, the one that he called the finest invention of the present age, is this polygraph invented by John Isaac Hawkins and Charles Wilson Peel, Jefferson had two, one here at Monticello and the second at the President's house in Washington. So he had an instant copy of the letter he was writing. That's right. So here he's used that architectural trick of a quick change in scale, the low ceiling in the study, very high ceiling in the bedroom, and between the, the alcove for the bed, right? That's right. He had seen these alcoves in France and incorporated them into the Monticello that he designed mm -hmm. in the 1790s. And at the foot of this alcove, he placed an obelisk clock. It was a design of his own. He had it made in Paris by a Parisian cabinet maker, clockmaker named Chantreau. And he arose each morning when he could see the face of this clock. He died in this bed, astonishingly, on July 4, 1826, the 50th anniversary to the hour of the moment that he presented the Declaration of Independence that he had written to Congress. That part of the story really gives you goosebumps. And this house really and truly is one of the great antique houses of America. Thanks for the tour, Susan. Thank you. The genteel and intellectual Mr. Jefferson set the stage for a new era. The plantation economy grew strong over the next 50 years in the fertile soil of the South. From Virginia to the Mississippi, a new generation of wealthy Americans began to build on the traditions of Thomas Jefferson in the land where cotton was king. That's the mighty Mississippi River behind me. The Natchez Indians made their home along the banks of this river for who knows how many centuries until the Europeans came along and wiped them out. The Natchez Trace still remains. That was their trading route all the way up to Nashville. Today it's a highway. Well, interesting things happen along here after the turn of the century in the early 1800s. We've already invented the cotton gin. Now we're planting cotton across the river. And it's king cotton. People are making fortunes. And of course, steam-driven paddle boats are coming up and down the river. So those fortunes are just multiplying enormously. And these wealthy planters are building show places, palaces, mansions, right here in places like Natchez, Mississippi. First, let's look at the house on Ellicott Hill, which is actually a modest house. Come on. All of this rich land along the Mississippi River belonged at one point or another to the Spaniards, the French, and the English. It wasn't until late in the century that the United States acquired it. 
The city of Natchez grew along the higher land, the banks of the river, this area here known as Ellicott Hill. Andrew Ellicott was sent out by George Washington. He was a surveyor. He came out in 1797, and he was the first to plant the flag here. This is an interesting house because it was built for a merchant. It was uh, a merchant who had come here in the 1790s, and this house is not typical of the southern plantation house. It could be in the Caribbean, in the colonies down in the islands. And it has detailing that make it very comfortable in a hot, humid climate. A gallery like this, a place that wasn't just a point where you came out and took a look, but a place where you set up chairs and, and uh, relaxed. Notice chair rails, baseboard moldings on the outside wall. Let's go inside. The architect of this house is unknown. But he or she was classically trained. And one of the things that you see about the room right away is that it's perfectly uh, proportioned and symmetrical. It's 20 by 32. The front door and the back door line up. So do the windows. You get cross ventilation. You have matching chimneys at either end. And the detailing in here on this side of the room is original. The same chair rail we were just looking at outside, which meets into this beautiful pilaster and this mantelpiece here. Punch and gouge decoration. This is a gouge chisel that takes that out, and a punch makes the circle. But the detailing aside, it's also an important piece of uh, preservation history. In the South, in Charleston, in 1931, the first historic district is, uh, is formed. Here in Natchez, the Garden Club, in 1934, acquires this property and saves it from destruction. This house had been used as housing for cotton workers. This room had been cut up into a little rabbit warren. Details like the domed ceiling had disappeared. And all of this is brought back. That's the original domed ceiling, which allows you to hang a chandelier this size in a room where the rest of the ceiling is really only 10 feet high. Originally, it could have been gilded to reflect the candlelight. Other features, like the matching mantelpiece, are restored by the ladies of the Garden Club, who find the craftsmen to create the exact same detailing. Isn't it beautiful? Let's look in the dining room. The proportions in here are interesting, too. The room is 14 by 20, but what catches the eye right away is the arched ceiling. And there's not much attic or roof space above, because this is really a shed roof out there, and they've maximized it. This was one of the richest households in town back in the early 1800s. The merchant, Mr. Moore, probably could have set a table just like this, with beautiful china dessert plates and beautiful Bristol glass for port wine. Notice the mantelpiece in here ain't shabby either. Let's go to the other end. We'll see the same room furnished as a bedroom. Maybe the most special piece of furniture in this house is this tall case clock, which was made here in Natchez in 1826 by David Matheson, who was a local cabinet maker. He was known to have made only two clocks, and this is the only one they have ever found. Notice the Masonic decorative emblem up here, the eye, just as you'll see on our dollar bill. Come on in the bedroom. There's some interesting pieces to look at in here as well. As I said, this is exactly the same proportioned room as the dining room. And Here's an English piece of furniture. It's known as a harlequin because it is not what it appears to be. It looks like a slant top desk, but this bin would have held water, and this would have been the washstand, shaving stand, a basin below it to collect the wastewater, and even a bidet, a rich man's piece of furniture. Also, the bedding. This is a pretty standard pencil post bed, just pine, and of course, you've got the regular rope that gets tightened up. The real money would have been spent on the feather mattress and the hangings and all those details. Come in the adjoining chamber, which is a little kid's room. This little bunk bed over here is a very rare item. It dates back to around the 1820s and was made in New England. You can still see traces of the red paint on it. And if you look at this rather curious tool, this is what they used to tighten up the ropes that held the mattresses in place. You've heard the expression, sleep tight. Well, now we've looked at a rich man's house from the turn of the century, just before King Cotton, the Mississippi River, and the fabulous steamboats made some of the people here in the Deep South super rich. Let's go to Rosalie. When the French owned these lands, they built a fort on this site, and they called it Rosalie, overlooking the Mississippi River. 
They had gone and a man named Peter Little bought this land and built his mansion house. He decided to keep the name, it's a pretty name. And it's a remarkable house. Now, Mr. Little had made a lot of money around here planting cotton on the other side of the river. In fact, he also owned one of the first steam-driven sawmills in the area. And he built this house in the latest fashion. Look at the size of the columns on that front portico. Think back to the house that we were just looking at in Ellicott Hill and how grand this has become. In fact, these columns, this portico, kind of uh, forecast the coming Greek Revival style that'll be in its height in another 10 or 15 years. But this is the early 1820s. And you look at either side of the portico and you see the brick and you see the symmetry and you see the same feeling that we were looking at earlier with the Thomas Jefferson houses in Virginia. Right now, let's join Ron Miller, executive director of the historic Natchez Foundation. He'll be our tour guide. Hello, Ron. Hi, Bob, how are you? Great, how are you? It's a pleasure to have you here. It's good to see you. Thanks. And it's great to be at Rosalie. The first of three antebellum mansions that we'll be visiting. Now, my first question is, why did they build them so big? Well, they could. <laughs> they could show how much money they had. They yeah. could be comfortable in a larger house, yes. both in having extra space and in having bigger spaces for the heat to rise up to this high ceiling. Because this normally is a very hot climate, right? It is, most of the year very yeah. hot. What are the dimensions of this front hall? Well, it's 50 feet long, mm -hmm. and it's 11 feet across, and it's 12 feet tall. And it's not interrupted by a staircase? No, the stair hall is off to one side in a separate room where the stairs go all the way up to the attic to is that typical Natchez design? Almost every Natchez big house has a side stair hall like that. Interesting, yeah. What about a light like this? Well, it's uh, typical of the house, uh, not of the house as it was when it was built, but by the mid-19th century, this Rococo revival, Great Believes, is typical. Is this one a... came from a steamboat, though. Did it really? Yeah, was put in the house later. It's an interesting piece, so ornate. And the, the other question is, the woodwork, the millwork in a house like this, was it produced locally? Almost always it was made really? locally. We know from one letter written home to Massachusetts in mm -hmm. 1812, a cabinet maker said he was employing more than 300 people in his shop making millwork for big houses But like he was this. a Yankee, huh? He was a Yankee. Ah. Uh, most everybody here came from somewhere else. I've heard about the famous Belter furniture here at Rosalie, and at last we're looking at it. Isn't this something? Tell us about Belter furniture. Well, it was made by John Henry Belter in New York, and this particular set of furniture is one of the most famous ones. The pattern of carving in it is known as the Rosalie pattern, named for the set in this house. Mm -hmm. the, what I've always loved about Belter furniture is that the fellow really invented a laminating method that then steam bent the rosewood and gave it the strength to be, you know, a little chair like this, so delicate, and where you could still carve this deeply into the wood. How many pieces do you have? Uh, more, than a, more than 20 pieces. Amazing. Is this table also laminated? It's not laminated, it's solid rosewood. It's elaborately carved with grotesque animal heads at each corner. Mm-hmm. Quite a neat piece. The wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in the room is awfully exuberant. Is that typical? Typical of the mid-19th century, mid-Victorian taste. Okay, and what's happened here is that the builder sold the house to another family by the mid-19th century. Yes. And that family then redecorated and bought all this furniture and did all these great things, right? Right. Mm -hmm. They had a daughter in New York in school, and that's where they shopped. Yeah, I've never seen so many pieces in one room. Tell me about something like this big piano in the corner, though. This what do you call it? Square Grand Piano. They, they, you find them in many houses in Natchez. They're almost really? a dime a dozen. Really? And most people would like to see them in a larger place like this. Mm-hmm. That's where they belong. Yeah. I've heard of pieces like this being turned into a desk. Yes, I've seen them as tables also. Could we take a look upstairs? Sure, let's Great. go. How many bedrooms up here? Well, Bob, there are only four, but they're big. I bet. <laughs> it's a big house, just four bedrooms. Yes. Uh, let's look in here first. Go ahead. General Gresham. A Union General who was in charge of Natchez during the occupation during the war. Big bed. It was a big bed for a big bedroom. Now, what do you call this type of bed? It's a four-columned, four-post, full-tester bed. Full-tester bed. Yeah. And, of course, you could hang all sorts of fabric and mosquito netting or mosquito whatever Mosquito netting, off of especially it. in the South. Is it made here in Natchez? No, we just discovered that it was made in Massachusetts, though it's a plantation bed. Interesting. Well, they probably exported a lot of furniture from the North to the South. We're finding that more and more. What's through here? Another bedroom. This bedroom was the children's bedroom. It has two beds. Both of them have half testers. 
for the mosquito netting. So that's netting. the tester up there. Yes, that's yeah. the tester up here. The big story here is the big bed. Yeah. It has a little pad on the side where you can either kneel and say your prayers or hop up into bed. <laughs> that's fabulous. The next bedroom I'd like to show you, Bob, is where General Grant stayed. Great. When General Grant visited Natchez, he stayed at Rosalie because it was the headquarters for the Federal Army. Okay. This is the bed in which he slept. Really? The Another big bed? Four posters, again, and a full tester. Yeah. According to the family, it was made in Philadelphia. Oh, really? Yes. High style. Ron, we'll join you again a little bit later in the hour. Right now, we're going to be taking you to Stanton Hall. The house on High Street known today as Stanton Hall, was built in 1857 by Frederick Stanton, an Irish immigrant who called it at the time Belfast. He was the richest guy in town. He made a fortune planting cotton. He had five plantations, hundreds of slaves, and he lived at the high point, really, of Southern culture before the war between the states. And this is probably the most magnificent example of Southern architecture to be found anywhere. Stanton Hall, a 10,000 square foot house. We're gonna look at it in detail, but don't miss any of the details as we approach. The granite steps, the incredible cast iron fence and gates that's around the whole place. Stanton planted 19 live oak trees on the property. 17 of them survived. They're 137 years old now. But let's talk about the house itself. It is massive, 60 feet across. It's 72 feet deep, two stories. And I guess the portico is the most exciting thing about this house. It was designed, or rather built, using the designs of Minard Lefebvre, a New York architect whose book, The Beauties of Modern Architecture, published way back then in the 1840s, I believe, really influenced the Greek Revival style and the construction of great houses all over the country. Look at some of the detailing on this portico. For example, in that triangular area in the inset, there is a beautiful scrolled decorative motif that repeats throughout the house. You'll even find it in some of the wrought iron and some of the cast iron. The columns themselves, two stories high, massive columns made probably of brick that's been parged over. But the capitals are Corinthian order, modified Corinthian. They're not overly decorative. And of course, there's a gallery tucked in on the second level. Now, another interesting thing about the house is that it was created entirely by local craftsmen. Even the bricks were fired on a kill that was built right here on the property. The walls are three courses of brick thick, parged over, and then scored to resemble large stone ashlar. The house cost $83,000 to build back then. And you'll notice that the detailing isn't spared anywhere. It's on the east side, it's on the back. This two-story cast iron gallery that surrounds that oriel window is literally dripping with roses. The sad part of the story is that Frederick Stanton died within a month after completing and furnishing his dream house. His widow lived on for the next 40 years with the family. In the 1890s, the house turned into a, a school for girls. By the 1930s, the Pilgrimage Garden Club had acquired the property and started its conservation. They, in fact, entertained soldiers here during World War II, but for the last 30 or 40 years, it's been open to the public. An interesting thing that we should note is that many of these beautiful houses in Natchez survive today because during the Civil War, the railroad had not yet arrived in this town, so it had no strategic importance. And we're blessed for that. Let's go in that beautiful front door and meet with Michelle Cardineau, who's a docent here, who will give us a tour. Hi, Bob. Welcome to Stanton Hall. Thank you, Michelle. It's good to see you. Good to see you. And isn't this magnificent? Isn't it? Front to back, 72-foot front hall. Exactly. <laughs> isn't it wonderful? Tell us about the architectural embellishments in this hall. Well, the moldings are wood, which is uh, cypress, mm -hmm. wonderful, very mm -hmm. durable wood. Sure. And then you notice our beautiful arch here, which structurally serves no purpose. It was uh, just a decorative piece, but it was hand carved from a single piece of cypress. Single piece of cypress. Exactly. Ah. Uh, and what about the portraits up here in the hall? Well, they're family portraits. Over here is Mr. Stanton in his early 60s, and as you know, he died shortly after they moved in. Yes, indeed. Now tell us, the, the carpeting, in the, in the, it's like wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, but it's a very yes, unusual yes. pattern. Yes, uh, this is a reproduction of a mid-19th century Brussels pattern laid mm -hmm. in strips mm -hmm. held together with carpet tacks. Mm -hmm. We had some in the 40s. We recently replaced it about three or four years ago uh, here in a factory in Mississippi, computerized. You mean you, you made Brussels carpet right here in Mississippi? Yes, we did. Well, that's exciting. 
Now, what about the furniture in the hall? Is it all original to the place? Uh, no, we've had a couple of pieces sent back to us, about 18 from descendants. A lot of it, though, uh, was sent back to us from uh, women in the garden club. I see. This is an original piece, the hall tree. This is Gothic Revival. Yes. Yeah, the chairs especially are unusual. I've never seen any like this. They have compartments. Maybe people could store their hat or their gloves in there. Yes. Yeah. So how many rooms on the downstairs of the house? Downstairs, four rooms. We have the back part, the front part, the dining room, and then we have the library, which was Mr. Stanton's. Shall we begin in the library? Let's do it. The library is the smallest room in the house, Bob, 21 by 21. And the ceilings are high. Yes, they are. They're just under 17 feet. Is that right? And look at this chandelier. I've never seen anything like it. No, Bob, these were made in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania by Cornelius and Baker. Uh -huh. They're made of pot metal. These things look like maces and they're swords. I guess it's a military theme, huh? Yes, it is. Those are French warriors. On the top there. Yes. And you said it's made out of pot metal? Yes, it is. Which is an alloy, right? Yes, it is. It's beautiful. Well, it's strong. How about the wallpaper in this room? Well, this is a wallpaper that was put up in the 1940s mm -hmm. of tobacco. So those are tobacco leaves in yes, the pattern. They are. How appropriate. And is any of the furniture in here original? Yes, Bob. The library desk and the chairs with it are original pieces sent back to us uh, a year ago, December, by can a descendant. I, can I open? Yeah, it's all carved oak, isn't it? And I think it's Renaissance Revival style. Yes, it is. Which would have been popular in the mid-1800s. Uh, mid That's right. So you said the desk is, and, and what about this piece back here? The bookcase is also original. Carving is unbelievable. Well, let's look at a bigger room. How about that parlor? How about the parlor? Michelle, this is a vast room. Isn't it beautiful? Now, the house is symmetrical, so we know that this is 21, and the full dimension would be 72. Exactly, yes. A 16. Mm -hmm. And look at the detailing in here. Look at that arch, huh? Well, now, this triple arch, again, is made of cypress, mm -hmm. and it, too, is just a decorative piece. Mm -hmm. What about this pair of consoles down here? Uh, these are Empire from New York. Uh, we think date 1860s. But you'll notice the urn. Now, that's a German Meissen urn. Uh-huh. That's probably 18th century. Yes. And I'd guess the tables are a little bit earlier than 1860. They're probably 1820s, thereabouts. What about this piece here? It looks Victorian. Well, it is, and this is an original piece. We actually had two in the dining room. So this is part of the original uh, Stanton furniture? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And we had two, as I said, and they cost $100 back then. You've got an inventory of all that furniture? We sure do, Bob. That's great. This is what they call a pier mirror. Yes. Which normally would be placed just like you see here in between two windows. But this is the giant I mean, that's big. It is, yeah. it is. And it came complete with the console table under it. So this is a separate piece. Yes, it is. You're lucky to have it all together, yeah. So, you've got uh, what I guess is Carrara marble here? It is Carrara marble. Yeah. It I was, think I've seen similar fireplace mantles. It was hand carved in New York. And what's neat is that they've got the grape leaves and the cluster of grapes, which I've just been looking at in the pendant of the arch up above. So that somebody sure. was really thinking in terms of all these exactly. decorative elements and ordering them. Exactly. Now, this is, is uh, a Victorian piece of furniture, I believe, what they call an étagère. That's what it is, Bob. Yeah, yeah. And we were just on the outside of the house admiring this bay window, which is surrounded by this kind of gallery of wrought iron, cast iron. Isn't this wonderful? Now, this was actually where the musicians would sit for the balls. They mm -hmm. would uh, come back here so they'd be out of your way when you were dancing. Yeah. I'll tell you something interesting, though, while we're back here, yeah. and that is about the drapes. Now, the drapes back here actually cost Mr. Stanton in 1859 $2,200. a lot of money back then. Yes, exactly, it was. But the, in comparison, the Pyramira I just showed you cost him 400 back So the then. drapes cost more than that enormous mirror did. Yes. And, of yes. course, these are not the original drapes. No, these are Bob, very the originals much. were red and white, hmm. and we were very fortunate that we've got these from a Scalamandra company. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful combination of beiges and yellows and very appropriate to the room. Yes. Look at the size of these doors, huh? Aren't they wonderful? These are the biggest pocket doors I've ever seen. They must be 12 feet high. Yes. And they're grained, aren't they? Yes, they are. Yeah, it looks to me like the original graining was meant to imitate mahogany over here. And this section here has been uh, doctored up more recently. But this is special, huh? Sheffield silver, Bob. 
Very, very nice. Let me see if I can put it back where it was. So this, when the doors were closed, would be a separate parlor, right? Exactly. This was the ladies' parlor, Bob. Ah. And it does have a feminine air, too. Look at the carving on this, huh? This is an original piece. The chair came back to us a year ago, December. The style of this particular chair is Rococo Revival, and I'm sure it's American. Yes. Yeah, but look at the crispness of the carving there and the depth of it, huh? Isn't that pretty? And what about this piece? I've never seen something like this. Uh, well, this is a window seat attributed to John uh, Belter. Oh, really? So it's probably laminated. Yep, it is. Very, very nice. The rug in here is possibly French? It's an Aubusson. It is French. And that would mean it's probably 18th century? Yes, we think so. Very delicate piece, huh? Very nice room. What, I've never seen anything like that under the glass there. What is it? Well, this is what the ladies would do, a very Victorian thing for the ladies to do back then. Uh, this is made of seashells. Wow. No wonder they have it under a glass dome, huh? That is intricate. Well, where to next? How about the dining room, Bob? Sure. My favorite gasoliers in the entire house, Bob, are in here in the dining room. They're outrageous. Aren't they beautiful? I see American Indians and buffaloes and Very maybe wild. even corn stalks up there, huh? Exactly, exactly. Uh, there are similar ones to these in the Treasury Department in Washington, D.C. And these, of course, are original to the house. Yes, they are. How about are. the furniture in here? Is it also original or...? No, Bobby, it is not. It was all donated to the house from Garden Club members. Mm -hmm. It's quite a table. It is. Uh, it's solid mahogany, and it was made here in Natchez in 1837, so it predates Stanton Hall. You know, it's interesting. It's a big table, but it's not big enough for the dining room. No, it's not, Bob. It doesn't quite meet all the way under the, under the gasoliers exactly. at either end. Yeah. Mr. Stanton's would have seated about 24 people. This one only 16. Really? How about the silver? Well, the silver in here is very wonderful. This is our uh, favorite piece. However, this is by Gerard in England. And it's a terrine. It's a soup terrain. Quite a nice piece. And how about that little box over here? Well, this is the oldest piece of furniture in the house, Bob. It's mahogany. Yes, do you know what it is? I think I have an idea. It's the wine cellarette. Yes. And this would have been a gentleman's uh, treasured possession in the mid-1700s, I'm sure, I'm sure. Well, can you show us a little bit of the upstairs? I certainly can. I guess I should assume the second floor hallway is as big as the downstairs hall, right? Yes, yep. it is, Bob. It's 72 by 16. Ah, amazing. And we do know that in the original inventory, mm -hmm. after Mr. Stanton's death, they had 41 chairs up here. Why 41 chairs? Well, they were left over from the balls or the parties. They would store them up here. I see. Sure. Well, you didn't want all those chairs cluttering the downstairs, exactly. did you? The doors are oak, or are they grained? They're grained? Yep. They're beautiful. Are all of them up here grained like all this? All of them in the house, yes. Yeah. And I recognize the wallpaper in here. This is uh, that French Zubair wallpaper yes, with it these is. fanciful scenes from around the world. In fact, look at that wonderful building with the onion domes. That's reminiscent of the next house we'll be visiting, which is called Longwood. Another beautiful house here in Natchez. Yeah. Now, this is a fine table. It looks like an English table. This was actually down in our library till just a couple of months ago when mm -hmm. we got the library desk back. Well, this is, I believe, what they call a rent table. And when you have drawers in a round table like this, not all of them can be square or rectangular. Four of them have to be shaped like this. Can we take a look at one of the bedrooms? Yes, how about Mrs. Stanton's right here? Oh, look at the colors in here. It's teal on all the bed hangings and the furniture, and the, the carpet is kind of a raspberry red, isn't it? Yes, it is, Bob. This is actually Schumacher, the fabric. So it's available now. It's new fabric. It's Natchez collection. Uh, therefore, we get a royalty for every piece of the fabric that is sold. Good. That helps to maintain the property, right? Yes, it right? does. Now, is any of the furniture in here original from the Stanton's day? Yes, Bob. We have two spool chairs, which are original. This is something special. Spool chairs. They're called that because of all the turning along here that looks like spools of thread. Right. Yeah. And is this original? This is outrageous. This is an original piece. Isn't it beautiful? This was actually appraised in 1859 for $100. Now it was appraised recently for $20,000. 20000 Yes. Well, it's probably very rare. Could we see another bedroom? How about the bedroom across the hall? We just recently got in a painting over there. I think you'll love. Bob, this painting was painted by a local artist, Louis Joseph Bayon. The Calco sisters were born in Natchez in the 1850s, and the paint is on loan to the Pilgrimage Garden Club by descendants. 
It's a beautiful and colorful portrait. But what's really neat is the fact that there's so many families in Natchez that are willing to lend their heirlooms so that houses like this can be furnished beautifully. Mm -hmm. Now let me ask you about this. Are there several fireplaces in the upstairs like this? Five, just like this. You know, I've seen them before. This is Italian black marble with that nice pink streak and a little bit of gold fleck in it. And look at the, the detail over here in the center of a seashell, kind of. But what's interesting to me about these, these cold-burning fireplaces is that I've seen them in old builders' catalogs. And they're not that rare. They're usually in expensive homes. But you could get these shipped out, crated, you know, all the flat pieces. And then they're assembled with wire back there and plaster of Paris. And that's it. It's a beautiful fireplace. Yes, it is. The furniture in here, is any of it Stanton? Uh, that has not been documented, although it is from period. From the same period? Exactly. This is a mahogany four-poster tester bed of humongous proportions. And if we look at the, uh, the front of it over here, you can see that this is what, what's known as uh, flame veneers. It's, it's a veneer that's booked so that they flip it and they create the mirror image there. And the whole thing kind of looks like a flame, doesn't it? This is unusual, though, to have a bed like this, or maybe it's not, to have a, a little sleigh bed right in front of the big four-poster? It was also a day bed. Uh, if they wanted to take a nap in the daytime, instead of taking a, a nap in this bed, they would take a nap in this. It's gorgeous furniture. And we haven't talked much about the uh, wardrobes or armoires, but uh, they were prevalent in, at this period in time in all these houses, right? Yes, they were. Yeah, here's the, the same detail in flame mahogany. Of course, I've heard that the reason everybody had to have wardrobes in their houses is that nobody had closets. Well, they also didn't have linen closets, Bob. I have a wonderful linen press I'd like to show you right Let's over here. Let's take a look at it. Oh, yeah, that's nice. That almost looks like a Pennsylvania piece mm -hmm. with that heavy cornice on the top. And I think it's walnut, right? Yes. Look at that. Well, it's a beautiful house. I wish we had more time to see all the other bedrooms, Michelle. Hope you get a lot of visitors, and thanks for the tour. Thank you, Bob. And now, a whimsical palace with a tragic fate. Just a few miles outside of the center of Natchez, we've come to Longwood, a spot high above the town and above the river, a salubrious spot where, since colonial days, people have had dwellings. In fact, there was a beautiful colonial house here that existed in the mid-1800s, and there was a gentleman named Haller Nutt, a doctor who, in fact, had made great wealth, who bought that property. He had made his wealth by developing strains of cotton that were very resistant to insects and pests. And in fact, well before the Civil War, Dr. Nutt was a bona fide millionaire. He owned six plantations, upwards of 40,000 acres, all of it planted in cotton. And he bought this high spot, Longwood, as a surprise for his wife, who had come here to visit and play as a child. He, in fact, brought her out here and surprised her by showing her a house and going inside, and he'd already moved all of her possessions. But after they'd used it several summers, it became obvious that they needed bigger quarters for their summer occupation. They had eight children. And so Dr. Nutt, who was perusing a book of architectural designs from the Sloan firm in Philadelphia, a well-known architectural firm, saw a picture of something that he just adored, an oriental villa. And he contacted Sloan and asked, could you modify this villa to accommodate my needs? read 32 rooms. And indeed, they did. It was uh, shortly before the Civil War that work began on what was to be a monolithic sandstone appearing monument. You see it in brick, but if you look at the very top of the cupola where we have that spire, that is the color that the entire house would have been. But let's get up close. It was on the eve of the Civil War that construction got underway here at Longwood. All the brick was fired locally on a kill right here on the property. But the architectural firm in Philadelphia sent down a job foreman and 70 woodworkers, whose job it was to come up here, build a, a, a little mill, and start crafting all the wooden trim for the house. The columns, the brackets, the gingerbread, all those wonderful elements that make it so unique. Of course, they were working with Cypress. They also brought down a tinsmith from Philadelphia who had to figure out how to clad that onion dome in tin and make it watertight. Let's go inside now. We'll meet Ron Miller, who's going to tell us a little bit about the lore of Longwood. The interiors were never finished. Ron? Ron? There you are. Hey, Bob. How are you? Fine. This is an eerie place to enter. After looking at this marvelous exterior, to come inside and see nothing but bare brick and joist work, like the Tower of Babel, all the way up to the top of the Onion Dome. Tell us the story of what happened here. 
Well, the workmen had almost finished the building when the war broke out. Mm -hmm. The five workmen from Philadelphia were afraid they'd never make it home through the blockades the North had placed on the South. Right. So they left immediately to make their way home and arrive safely. Mm -hmm. But they left behind a building that was never finished. So that the future of Longwood was broken and the yes. family fortunes were ruined as well. That's right. But it has managed to survive intact. You would think that it'd be a derelict building 130 years later. Right. Why is that? Well, they had finished the roof work. Yeah. They boarded up the walls and it was so well constructed that it has remained all this time. Look at this. This is probably a, some sort of scaffolding that was being used. Yes. And what's in here? Here's the carpenter's workbench with some of their tools still here as they left them. Look at that. This thing's been around for 130 years. Nothing's been disturbed here no. since then. Paint think... pots, nail kegs, tools, hinges, 130-year-old dust. I it's think that's exactly amazing. right. It really is amazing. Is it possible to climb into the structure up there? Yes, we can go this way and go up. Whoop. All right, we've climbed all the way up to the third level of the house and still could go higher into the cupola, but I think this is a good vantage point. Now, can you help us understand the architecture here? Was this space meant to be open? Yes, this served as a central chimney to exhaust the hot air out the upper part of the observatory. Mm -hmm. On this floor, the third floor, was where the children and servants would live. Yeah. The floor below the second was where the family's private bedchambers were located, and below that, the first floor, were the grand reception rooms for the public. All of it masonry up to that level, and up here we see this remarkable framing with all the cross bracing yeah. and all the lath in place. Well, Bob, these were the palaces of America's cotton barons that centered here at Natchez. It was a place where America's richest men of the 19th century displayed their wealth, taste, and refinement. Mm -hmm. The crowning glory of them all was Longwood, a dream that was never realized cut short by the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And yet it's managed to survive for 130 years, almost to the point that you could pick up plaster and start putting it into these, these rooms around here, where the lath is ready for the plaster's trial. Yeah. They were nearly finished. So, but none of it was finished? None of it was finished when work stopped, and then they had to come back and retrofit the basement to make living quarters for the family who lived there until the 1960s. Let's go look. And this is a pretty clear line of demarcation between the brick where the work wasn't done and a finished basement. A very nice uh, space. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. So what's this, this area here? This is the rotunda, all separated from the rotunda above by the ceiling, but with holes in it to let the light come down. It's an octagon as well. Uh, just as it is above, and off it are eight rooms, four bedrooms, a living room, a dining room, and a few other rooms as needed by the family. And the family actually lived here for several well, generations for after the war? almost 100 years, yes. Really? What befell the, 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 the Nutt family immediately after the war? Well, before the war was over, Dr. Nutt died. Mm. His wife left behind her story of what happened to him in her own words. She said, on June 16, 1864, I buried my husband. It was not pneumonia that killed him. The doctor said it was not. It was $3 million worth of property swept away by the war, leaving him responsible for his wife, eight children, and two other families, all of whom looked to him for support, which he could not give. This crushed him, and he died. Then, notwithstanding my protection papers from General Grant, all was taken from us, and then began the dark and winter days of my life. Many a day then, and in days since then, have I fed my children on weeds and sour milk and sent them to bed half-starved. The world did not know what was going on in my private household and could not pity us. A great sadness. Thank you for your hospitality, Thank Ron. Thank you, Bob. Our next house is in Texas. Some houses come complete with legends. This one has to do with a card game. When James Drawn played his game of poker, he was known as Captain Drawn. He'd been an officer of the Confederate States of America. He was also a high-stakes gambler. In the 1880s, the East Texas town of Texarkana was the place to find a high-stakes poker game and gamblers eager to play. It was a night in 1885 that Captain Drawn, who'd made a fortune in lumber and dry goods, really hit the jackpot, winning 10,000 bucks, all thanks to the presence of an ace of clubs in his winning hand.
Thus, the inspiration for the Ace of Clubs house, the home he'd built with his winnings. We're in Texarkana, Texas, but straddling the line with Arkansas. A great example of a town that's really a boom town made possible by the arrival of the railroads in the 1870s and 80s, and of the reconstructed South, a place where new fortunes were being made, shipping cotton from the South to the new New England mills, shipping lumber from this area all over the country on the railroads to build new towns. This house behind me is a curious survivor of that period. It's a Victorian house. It has wonderful examples of the Italianate style of more influences but what's most interesting is that it's a, a survivor of a wonderful story the man who built it and of a wonderful family that lived in it for a hundred years let's go inside and meet Ina McDowell who's gonna give us a tour hello Ina hi Bob welcome to the Ace of Clubs house thank you I hear the interiors here are pretty spectacular but why is it really called the Ace of Clubs house well Bob you've heard the legend of the card game but mm -hmm. did you know that the house is actually built in the shape of the club suit oh I see the club suit yeah so it's built with a series of octagonal masses around a rectangle that really give you the shape of the club suit yes we're standing in the center and then we are surrounded by the other three octagons and this central one is the the main kind of ceremonial entry and staircase how high is it to the top of the uh, to the very top of the cupola up there well bob from where we are standing at this point in the center of the house it is 46 feet and tell us about the wallpaper well, the wallpaper is made to look like a French tapestry. Sure. And when the museum system took over the house, we found a small portion of this wallpaper, and then it was reproduced. So the Cap'n built the house, but then another family took it over, right? That's right. It was the Moore family that bought the house in 1894. And they really decorated it at the height of the Gilded Age. Look at this fireplace over here. Yes, this is actually not a working fireplace, mm -hmm. but as you can see, it is an English marble mantel with French mirror. Mm -hmm. Are there any remnants of when the captain built the house? Yes, there are. Most of the house has been sort of frozen in time from when the Moore family here was living here in 1894. Yeah. But we do have one room we call the drawing room. The drawing room? The drawing room. The drawing room. Come this way and I'll show you. In this room, we have a portrait of Captain Drawn. This portrait was done in his later years. He was one of the Texas side's first mayors here in Texarkana. The Texas side of the state line, because yes. the city straddles both sides of the line. That's right. Okay, so he, he was a distinguished fellow. He became a, a mayor. Yes, and he was also very well known for promoting public utilities and free education. Wonderful. Is this all his furniture? No, actually, this is furniture that would represent that same period of time, the Renaissance Revival. Mm -hmm. So you have a parlor suite in the Renaissance Revival style, but I gotta say, this is not Renaissance Revival. Well, this is the Wooten desk. Mm -hmm. It was designed and built by William Wooten and was actually very trendy at this time in the late 1800s. Yeah, they manufactured these for about a decade. And, and in a way, they're kind of like an early personal computer because there's so many cubbies and slots and places to enter data and hold it and yes, lock it up. Mr. Wooten was so proud of what he had designed, he even presented one to President Ulysses Grant and Queen Victoria. What a great self-promoter, huh? It is very rare, and there are very few that are still in the and United States. And it's quite, States. quite valuable, yeah. Well, where to next? Let's go to the music room. Okay. The interesting thing about this room is the timbre door. A tambour door, just like you'd have on a roll-top desk. Yes, actually, when the house was built, there wasn't room to have swinging doors or pocket doors, so the timbre doors were put in. Sure, it's an octagon. And what, what are the dimensions across? This room is 18 feet across with 14-foot ceilings. And if you'll notice in looking around the room, every wall either has a window, a mirror, or... Or an opening onto another area, right. The windows must be about 10 feet high. And they just really, with the drapes, give it such an air of elegance, as does the baby grand. Huh? Oh, this is the treasure of the house. The Baby Grand Steinway & Sons Piano. Really? Dates back to 1901. I saw one just like it in Birmingham. Oh, this is a real treasure for anyone to have had during this period of time. And did you know that Scott Joplin, father of ragtime music, was born right here in Texarkana? Really? So he could have played on this piano? Maybe so. Maybe so. You know, it's interesting, though, though the room is only 18 feet across, it's joined to the next 18-foot octagon by this square area, maybe six by six or That's seven right. by seven and then the other octagon with a staircase so that you feel like you're in a huge space but in fact you're not it's yes. neat 
Yes, it's very the good design. design. Is wonderful. And yet the architect of the house, nobody knows who, who designed it, right? No. To this day, we still don't know. We have no real documentation of who the architect was. This, the formal parlor, is where you would entertain the, the preacher the on preacher a Sunday. The preacher or um, any type of entertainment would be done in this house. Yeah. I love the, the dusky rose color. These, these curtains must be, well, they must be new, right? Well, actually, no. There's an interesting story behind those curtains. When the museum got the house, there were no drapes in this room. During the restoration process, we found boxes with these curtains. They were taken out, hung, pressed, cleaned, and they looked fabulous. How old are they? They date back to around 1919 and were purchased in France by Miss Kate. Quality lasts, I guess, huh? Yes. What's through this timbre door? This door would lead us directly into the dining room. Oh, let me get it. Oh, this is a big room, isn't it? Yes, actually this room is 18 by 27 feet. The biggest room in the house. Yes, it is, and also a very important room. This is where the family would gather for three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They all gathered for a formal dining for all three meals. There were many people in, in help here? Oh, yes. From time to time, there are anywhere from four to six servants that would help serve, depending on what was being done or if there was a, a party going so on. So was this the china and the linens and the crystal, all from the family, right? Yes. Everything you see here in this room, including the 16-piece Empire Revival Suite, all belong to the Moore family, mm -hmm. as well as the crystal, silver, and china. And the carpet? Well, actually, if you haven't noticed, take a closer look. It's upside down. It is, isn't it? When the carpet was first purchased, it was bought during a time when the Oriental rug was popular. Then at the turn of the century, French tapestry became popular. So people just flipped the rugs over. So nothing has changed in this room in almost 90 years or longer. That's true. Since the time that the room was originally remodeled in the early 1900s. The fireplace? Yes, this is called a pressed buttered brick. And as you can see, it has a very smooth finish to it. And what about this wall treatment here? This is called lincrusta. It yeah. is a combination of linen and paper pulp mm -hmm. bound together by linseed oil. And it is supposed to look like a hand-tooled leather, a Spanish, Spanish leather. leather. Sure. And above it? The above wall covering is a reproduction of a print that was a Morris print that would have been typical during this same time period. So these things were restored in the 1980s when the house became a museum? Correct. Good. Correct. Can we see the kitchen? Yes, come this way. Boy, it sure is a green room. Yes, it is. But this was a very common color in the 1920s when this kitchen was designed. Originally, it was down in the basement and then brought upstairs. What's the floor material? It's called battleship linoleum, and it's actually very durable and would have been used on battleships. Green and a green stove, too, yes, huh? Yes, we are very proud of the stove. It dates into the 1920s, and as far as we know, it, it does still work. It's a beauty. Okay, well, could we take a look upstairs? Yes, let's go. This little alcove area was used for the children for doing their homework. And the nice thing about it was their mother could look down upon them from above in the landing and see to make sure they were doing their homework. More octagons. Yes, we're at the second level of the Moore home. And there were actually three generations of Moore families that lived in this house. In a century, yeah. Yes, this room would represent a boy's room about 1942. And as you see, he was a very privileged young boy to have a hi-fi system within Texarkana. And he also played baseball in all the other games. He did play liked. baseball yeah. as well. And then through here, connecting on to the next octagon, we've got uh, Yes, a bathroom, but this is not 1942. No, actually this would show a transition in time from the 1942 bedroom to a 1901 bathroom. In this next bedroom, you see another of the more generation men. This room represents a period of 1901 and is set up as it would have been as he was a bachelor. He was a very privileged young man too. As you can see, he was known for cruising around town with his duster over his blazer and white buckskin shoes. Driving a little Franklin Little Roaster Franklin or car, yes. Uh -huh. He was known for having an awful good time in that Franklin car. I bet. Tell me about the light fixture in here. I've never seen one quite like that. Well, it. actually, this is a gasolier, and it is designed to be lighted with either gas or electricity. Because at the time it was designed, it was thought that electricity was just a passing fad. And there was an architect up in New York who said, you better be careful, electricity can cause freckles. No kidding, really. Well, could we see a little girl's room? Yes, come this way. The next room we're coming into was Catherine Moore's room. She received this bedroom suit on her 16th birthday in 1938. 
Very French. It's said to be of the Marie Antoinette style furniture. Mm -hmm. And it's 1930s, and it looks like she was just here a minute ago listening to music and putting on her makeup. Yes, it does. Just typical mm -hmm. of a teenager's room. Could we see the master bedroom? Yes, right this way. This is a splendid room. Yes, this is Miss Olivia's room. And she lived alone in the house for a number of years and raised her two children in this house. So she was widowed? Yes, she was. Her husband had died in an early age. Mm -hmm. But as you see, this is one of the largest rooms in the house, and it's directly above the dining room. It's about the shoes. Well, there are approximately 500 pairs of shoes that were left to the museum by Miss Olivia. And as you can see, she loves shoes. And her favorite place to shop was Neiman Marcus in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And often, if she couldn't get to Dallas to do her shopping, well, they would just come to her. And they would bring a truckload with models and all and have a style show just for Miss Olivia. How special, right here in Texarkana. Yes. What's through here? This is the dressing room. So this was architect designed? Yes, around the 1930s, an architect came in and redesigned this area, giving Miss Olivia a cedar lined closet, her own bath, and as well as her own personal dressing area. Look, Look at, at this, this three paneled mirror. To show off the gowns and the shoes, I guess. Yes. And this she is a was... wonderful built in area. Yes, and look at the drawers, how they fit in and pull out so neatly. It's really Art Deco. Yes, it is. And I want to thank you for the tour, because it's really one of the most special houses I've visited, going all the way from the most unusual of Victorian architecture to Art Deco touches like this. Good luck. Thank you so much for coming, and we really enjoyed having you. Texarkana was a boom town. Its fortunes swelled by ranching and the railroads during Reconstruction. We've seen that in the Wild House, built with money from a wild card game. The prosperity of that era anticipates the great days of Texas and the New South. We've come a long way from the 18th century origins of the Old South in Jefferson's Virginia. The gracious traditions of the Southern elite abruptly collapsed with the Civil War. Though today that luxurious time is still to be seen in the great houses of Natchez. Even if you don't know the Ionic from the Ironic, I bet you found at least one place you'd be happy to call home. There's a sense of America emerging, yet there's also continuity in the elegance, style, and even the hospitality we've met with in the land of Mr. Jefferson and King Cotton. Mm -hmm.